Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Logitech stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Logitech is a computer peripherals and software company. It is one of the world's leading manufacturers of input and interface devices for personal computers and other digital products. The company develops and markets personal peripherals for PCs, videos, music, and smart homes. The products include keyboards, mice, tablet accessories, webcams, Bluetooth speakers, and more. In 2008, it manufactured its one billionth mouse. The company is headquartered in Switzerland and was founded in 1981. It started trading in 93 and can be found on the NASDAQ, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Börse, Swiss, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 16.5 billion market cap. They're trading at $98 a share and they have 169 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they do have positive and growing free cash flow. It goes from 300 million up to 1.1 billion. It did peak in 2021 at 1.4 billion. Free cash flow is a cash that's remaining after paying all your expenses and investing back into the business. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses, and that goes from 258 million to $1 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that doubles from 2019 to the trailing 12 months. Their sales have gone through the roof with COVID. All their sales are organic. They didn't get it through acquisitions. Lots of people are buying their products because more people are at home playing video games and working. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Here, here's a breakdown of their revenue by location. North America is their most revenue at 2.2 billion. And that nearly doubled from 2019. Europe, Middle East, and Africa is not too far behind at 1.7 billion. And that doubled from 2019. Asia Pacific is 1.3 billion and that almost doubled from 2019. So it is helpful to have a company that sells products all around the world because if you were focused in one country like United States or China and that country had difficulties, then that company's revenue may suffer. But since they're diversified, they sell all around the world, they don't have that type of risk. Here's a breakdown of their revenue by product and it increased in pretty much every product except for two. Mobile speakers has decreased and smart home has decreased. Their smart home products are Harmony and Circle. Their main smart home product are remote controls. The remotes are able to control the video cameras and security systems. But this is a really small part of their revenue. So even though it declined 21%, it really hasn't affected their overall business. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses that go into making the products. That includes the cost of materials and the cost of labor. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit and that peaked in the trailing 12 months at 2.6 billion. Below that is operating expenses. Marketing is their big operating expense at $770 million. Research and development is also a big expense at over 200 million because they always have to spend time and money developing new products or improving their older products. General and administrative is payroll. They pass through $19 million of amortization expenses. They may have acquired another company with a patent and they have to amortize that patent over its lifetime. When you amortize a patent, you decrease the value on your balance sheet and pass through an expense onto your income statement. Only intangible assets are amortized and fixed assets are depreciated. To make it even more confusing, not all intangible assets are amortized. Goodwill, for example, is impaired. Every year it has to be tested for impairment. Before 2004, Goodwill was amortized, but then FASB changed the rule that Goodwill had to be impaired. Not all fixed assets are depreciated. A building or vehicle is depreciated. Land is not depreciated. Land is carried on the balance sheet at the cost you paid for it. And that value never changes. The way to identify an undervalued stock, if a company has a lot of land on its balance sheet and the land was purchased a long time ago, say 20, 30 years ago, that means the value of the land was as of 20, 30 years ago. And just say, for example, the land was valued on a balance sheet at $1 billion, but you knew it was a lot more. Say you estimated it could have been $10 billion. 
Then if you buy the stock and the company sells the land or sells the business, they would get a huge cash injection and your stock may go up 10 times. And don't assume if that's the case, it would be known in the market. Very few people look at the financials at the detail we're looking at. Some people just look at net income or revenue and most people don't look at anything. They just listen to others like YouTubers or analysts. Below operating expense is their operating income and they have a ton of operating income each year from 274 million to 1.3 billion. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which grew from 258 million to 1 billion. So their income statement looks amazing. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So they generate a ton of cash flow, 300 million up to 1.2 billion. That's the cash that's left over after paying all their expenses to run their day-to-day -day business. And they don't have too much money in CapEx from 36 million up to 88 million. I thought they'd have more in CapEx since they manufacture products, but they don't. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they have a lot of free cash flow remaining. And they do pay you a small dividend. And they have been buying back more stock each year. They bought back 32 million in 2019, 50 million, then 164 million. When a company buys back stock, that decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. And they don't use debt to run their business. They have almost no debt on their balance sheet. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have 2.4 billion of equity. They raised 75 million from issuing stock. So it looks like they bought back most of their stock. As you can see here, they bought back over $300 million of stock. And they have $2.7 billion of retained earnings. That's their overall profit since they started as a business. That's amazing. They profited $2.7 billion from just receiving $75 million from issuing stock since they bought back so much stock. Treasury stock is a contra equity account. So to get your equity value, you sum all these numbers, but you minus treasury stock. You don't add it. That's how you get to 2.4 billion. Let's look at the capital structure. 2.4 billion of equity, 36 million of debt. They're 99% equity, 1% debt. Their weighted average cost of capital is 7.2%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 32 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $29 billion. We divide that by 169 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 171. They're trading at 98, so they're trading at a 43% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. According to Simply Wall Street, the average analyst projects their revenue to grow 8%. So the way I projected their future revenue, since their trailing 12-month revenue grew more than 8% from 2021, to calculate their 2022 revenue, I grew at 8% from the trailing 12 months. Then their 2023 was 8% growth from 2022 and 8% each year after that until 2025. And the way I calculated their future free cash flows, I needed to figure out what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I took the sum of these four free cash flow numbers and I divided by the sum of these four revenue numbers. And that's 19%. I multiplied my future revenue estimates by 19%. That's how I got my future free cash flows. And some people are saying they don't think their revenue will grow. They think it will actually go down because when COVID gets better or goes away, there'll be less people working from home. But I think their revenue will continue growing because they now have a larger population of customers because they have so many more people buying their products than before. And those people will buy other products as well. Plus, I think people are happy with working from home. A lot of people are going to stay working from home because they realize how convenient it is and how efficient it is. Not everybody will stay at home, but a lot more people will be working from home in two years from now than they were two years ago. Plus, of course, all their sales from the gaming market, that will continue growing. Simply Wall Street valued the company at 137 a share. They're saying it's 28% undervalued. Seven analysts priced this stock and the average price target was 131. This is where the stock has been trading since 97. So it looks like it was pretty flat for a while, but it is hard to tell on a chart with 24 years of data. But the real growth was in the past two years. It has regressed a bit from its peak, but it's still trading way higher than it was a year or two ago. Here's a candlestick chart from the last 12 months. The stock is up from a year ago, 
but it is flat since January. There was this big gap down when they reported earnings. What a gap means is there was a large difference between the opening price of one day and the closing price for a previous day. That indicates there was a lot of post and pre-market trading. This may happen during earnings or really big news announcements. 90% of gaps get filled. This gap has not gotten filled. The stock has come down. But 90% of the time, it will come up the stock. So there's a good chance it will get filled. And I think by next year, the stock will be up here at 150, 160. They pay an annual dividend. It's under 1%. They pay 87 cents per share. To calculate the dividend yield, just take 87 cents divided by the stock price. And they can easily afford this. It's only 14% of their net income, 13% of their free cash flow. They have a low beta 0.63, so the stock is not too volatile. The stock has gone up a little more than S&P the past 52 weeks, up 39%. S&P is up 33%. The 52-week low was 70. The high was 140. And the stock is trading well below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. This stock is not too popular. Less than 1 million shares are traded each day. Pretty much all the shares outstanding are on float. 73% are held by institutions and it has a pretty high short percentage. Over 7% of the shares on float are shorted. It looks like the short percentage peaked at about 10% on 8.13. That's a couple weeks after their earnings. And since the stock went down a lot during earnings, they obviously didn't beat their estimates. So shortly after earnings, more people started shorting the stock. And the short percentage came down to 7.3% at the end of August. So as the stock price comes down, the short percentage comes down. And the stock price is coming down more. So based on momentum, it may keep coming down. In the past three years and five years, this industry has done much better than the market. So has this company. Although this company has done a little worse than its industry in those time frames. Analysts are projecting their earnings to grow 7%, which is more than its industry, and their revenue to grow 8%, which is also more than its industry. This company has done really well the past five years. Their earnings is up 40% on average. In the past year, it's up 123%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd be really happy. Up 1,200%. Your $10,000 will be close to $130,000. The biggest shareholder is BlackRock at 9.2%. Then Capital Research, Vanguard. Then a Swiss fund, since this is a Swiss-based company, they own almost 3% of the stock. Then Acadian Asset Management, another U.S. firm. That's 2.8%. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have really good price multiples. Even though their market cap has come up a lot the past couple of years, they still have amazing price multiples. 15.6 PE, 2.9 price to sales, and 7.0 price to book. And they don't have that much intangibles on their balance sheet. Most of their growth is done organically. Look at this return on invested capital, 116%. They provide great value to their investors. They also have a really high ROE at 45%. A good current ratio of 2.1 and a good quick ratio of 1.6. They have 1.5 billion of cash on their balance sheet, 600 million of receivables, and 800 million of inventory. The company is well capitalized. They generated over 1.1 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. They have 1.6 billion of working capital, and they pay a small amount in dividends, so they have over $2.5 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of eight companies in the same industry as Logitech. And if Logitech has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. They're better than average in PE and price to sales. They're worse in price to book and current ratio. They have an amazing ROE. The average in the industry is negative. They have almost no debt. And they're one of the bigger companies on this list at 16.5 billion market cap. They do pay a small dividend, a little lower than the average. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 43% discount, but it seems like this company is just hitting its stride. They're crushing analyst estimates. Their revenue and free cash flow growing like gangbusters. This could be a $100 billion company in 10 years if they keep growing at this pace. I rank their free cash flows 8 out of 10, their revenue 9 out of 10, and their ratios 9 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation, or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.